Not you, I'm not worried about yeah. you. But just um, you know, if if I don't know, what kind of signal I'm going to give you, but you know, and it hurts because it's always now. So it's not funny. But some people it was I think it was too far. Okay. Yeah, we can move it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to talk over your interesting conversations for the rest of the day. Just kidding. Can you hear me in the back? All right. So we need to get started. So we, we can't cut into the time of early career researchers. That is a cardinal sin. Everyone knows that. So now is the time to lower your voice and enjoy the session. I, I'm really honored to, and privileged to introduce this exciting symposium. I just want to remind you that we're following the GSA Code of Conduct. Please silence your cell phone. Mass should be worn at all times, even when you're, or especially when you jump up in enthusiasm. Uh, the, the session's being recorded. And it's my job to give a little bit of context. So uh, here we go. And for your information, this is what I look like when I'm outside. James Crow was a PEQG giant who never passed up an opportunity to smile. He was born in 1916, the same year as a famous journal was founded. Genetics, that's right, good job. Uh, he got his bachelor's at Friends University, his PhD at the University of Texas, when he, where he summarily joined uh, the faculty at Dartmouth soon after, and then he joined the Laboratory of Genetics, a pretty great department at UW-Madison in 1948, where he stayed for the remainder of his life and stayed active. Jim died January 4, 2012. Jim awakened thousands and thousands of students to the power of genetics in a way that few could. In the classroom, he was known for distilling difficult concepts and holding his students to the highest of standards in a compassionate way. His text on theoretical population genetics first published in 1970 with Moto Kimura in many ways remains the gold standard. What some of you might know, not know is that his text on general genetics is one of the most widely read and circulated 
and translated genetics text ever. So Jim was a beloved teacher of genetics. He was also a pioneer of genetics research. Now to me, summarizing Jim's contributions to genetics research in a slide feels like describing Mozart's genius in a 30 second recording. You can't do it, but you should just read all his papers. Good luck. Uh, here are just a few highlights. On the theory side, Jim helped develop the influential infinite alleles model to explain levels of variation in natural populations. He refined the concept of genetic load to measure how average fitness of a population declines due to mutation and selection. And he extended theoretical models of sex, inbreeding, meiotic drive, and just about any other evolutionary topic that you can imagine that connects to genetic variation. He was really prolific on the theoretical side. He was also a leader in empirical population genetics. He supervised the discovery of segregation disorder system in Drosophila, which many of you know, one of the best worked out cases of meiotic drive. He supervised the discovery of P transposable elements. He supervised what remains a rare characterization of the selection coefficients and dominance coefficients of deleterious uh, mutations in nature. And it's still widely cited because it's so, the experiments are so backbreaking and you can't do it just with genomics. Just a little gem aside there. Um, so he, all in all, he published more than 250 papers, including many classics in the field that have stood the test of time. Jim believed, uh, perhaps more strongly than anything, that his students were his real legacy. This is an incomplete list of um, his students and postdocs. So hopefully you can see it, but it's a list of luminaries in the field. And Jim took mentoring very seriously. Wow, what, a, what an inspiring mentor he was. I would contend that it's simply impossible to imagine modern population genetics without the discoveries of Jim and his students. So much of his research shapes the discussions that we're having in this room now, the research trajectories of students and faculty. It's really a profound, thing to contemplate uh, Jim's contributions. But I wanna step back for a moment before I introduce um, the session a little bit more and give you a few minute personal view on Jim with some lessons that I learned from him. For my first seven years at UW-Madison in the laboratory of genetics, I would contend that I was the luckiest population geneticist in the world. My office was next to Jim's, and right up until his death. And he taught me so much. So here are just a few favorite lessons. And if you wanna hear more, I've got lots of stories that we can talk about afterwards. And Jim loved to tell stories. So. Science is social and fun. Jim absolutely loved to talk about science anywhere, anytime, and with anyone. I introduced Jim to my mother, a preschool teacher, and uh, he treated her with the same respect in terms of her intellectual thinking about evolution as he treated me or a National Academy member. Um, and he listened as well as he spoke. He expressed genuine curiosity about people and his ability to broker relationships between scientists with, let's say, strong and opposing convictions was legendary. Jim was a diplomat in addition to being an accomplished scientist. Ideas matter and so do their histories. Jim was a student of history. He believed that tracing the origins and development of ideas is a key part of understanding them. Importantly, this is a great message, I think, for all of us to remember. Reading deeply is as much a part of science as gathering and analyzing new data. For many years, Jim co-edited the perspective section of genetics. He often wrote historical pieces himself across a startling expanse of subjects, not just in population genetics, but all over the place, especially when contributors backed out at the last hour. 
the long arc of his view of the field was, I would say, exemplary and really rare, something that few scientists achieve, but we should all strive for. It was also a source of humility. One of the quotes I heard Jim repeat over and over again is he'd come in the labs, I just discovered something, and then he'd lean over and say, well, actually, it was new to me, but not new to science. Jim searched for truth, not credit. The influence of his thinking went far beyond his publication record. He didn't much care about whether his contributions were acknowledged, although he once admitted to me that he wished he had accepted an offer to be a co-author on this paper, which has made a, a pretty significant impact on the field. Jim recognized that science largely proceeds by rejecting explanations. He believed that admitting when we are wrong is an important part of scientific progress. I watched him practice this philosophy regularly. He would end scientific debates with his colleagues, sometimes intense debates, by writing, uh, composing handwritten letters that said, I was wrong, you were right. Thanks. Again, a lesson we could probably all use as an example. And Jim was especially grateful and felt no embarrassment when his colleagues persuaded him that he was wrong. As he used to tell me, you don't learn much when you're right. Interesting idea. So in 2016, the GSA founded the James F. Crowe Early Career Researcher Award with these goals in mind. Principally, we wanted to recognize Germ Jim's enduring impact on students and on the field and the example that he has set for so many of us. And we, of course, want to encourage promising early career scientists to reach for the stars. This year's judges are these outstanding early career researchers. Sorry, I didn't get a picture of Rory up there, but she helped. <laughs> um, and so these, these are, these, this is a group of outstanding researchers themselves that you're gonna hear more from at the meeting. Um, but if you have a chance, when you see them, please thank them for their service in this way. Based on submitted applications, we selected the five finalists who will speak in this symposium shown here. Each finalist will have 20 minutes to speak followed by five minutes of questions. And I know Jim, would be excited to hear from these outstanding researchers. He was always, I would say, disproportionately interested in the ideas of young people who had been, uh, who are usually less encumbered by ego um, and sort of a commitment to ideas that we've claimed in the first place. So let's follow Jim's lead and give them our undivided attention. Thank you. So our first speaker is Eileen McPherson. Thank you for being here uh, today to listen to this talk. Um, before I begin, I would like to recognize that the research done in this talk was gratefully done on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Salitude, Coquitlam, Squamish, and Musqueam peoples. I would also like to thank my co-authors that have contributed significantly to this work, in particular, Si Lu Wong, um, Rio Yamaguchi, Lauren Reesberg, and Sally Otto. So I wanna start with the story of hybridization. So at the peak of the glacial maxima, these Pacific warbler species were separated in glacial refugia on the Pacific coast, one in Northern Alaska, the other one on the United States Pacific coast. 
as the glaciers receded, these populations expanded, eventually having the populations come into secondary contact in two hybrid zones, one in Washington state and one in Oregon. This system represents one example of many examples I could have put up here today of post-glacial range expansion and secondary contact hybridization. These systems are of natural intrigue to us as evolutionary biologists because they represent natural laboratories that let us study the genetics of speciation and perform crosses that we could not do in a lab. Second, they're more recently recognized to be a important source of evolutionary innovation in the form of hybrid speciation. And lastly, they are of interest in their own right as we um, often see stable hybrid zones established in nature. Unfortunately, if you wanted to hear about these warblers, you would have had to invite Si Lu Wang to come talk to you. I'm a theorist, so how do I see these hybrid zones? Well, one traditional historical model of hybridization that is classic to the field is the tension zone model, first developed by Nick Barton and Godfrey Hewitt. And how this model uh, explains hybridization is that you have populations arrayed along a linear habitat, initially separated by a geographical barrier. At some point in time, this geographical barrier is removed, the populations come into secondary contact, and then they begin to intergress. What would we expect the outcome in this model to be? Well, we might be interested in the shape of allele frequency clines, and we can characterize those clines by their width, um, which will come back and haunt you later in this talk, which is the slope of the cline in the middle of the hybrid zone. All right, so what is our expectations about Klein width? Well, it depends on what allele we're talking about. If we're talking about a neutral allele, then on average, we would expect the allele to achieve a 50-50 allele frequency across the range. Obviously, there's going to be stochastic variation in this frequency, but on average, it should be around a allele frequency of 0 0.5. If we're talking about uh, allele under directional selection, for example, if the pink big A allele is favored, that pink big A allele is expected to sweep across the range as it's favored and eventually fix. Finally, we might have alleles that express genetic incompatibility. So there's multiple ways that you could have incompatible alleles, for example, under dominance uh, um, or heterozygote disadvantage. Um, and if this happens, then you can achieve a stable allele frequency climb that helps maintain the species barrier and is fundamental to the maintenance of those two independent parental populations. Today, I want to focus on a particular type of incompatibility called a Bates and Dobjansky Miller incompatibility or some rendition of that. Okay, so what is a Bates and Dobjansky Miller incompatibility? Well, how do they arise? Well, before the populations were separated, suppose that the big A, big B haplotype was fixed. Then once those populations were in allopatry, the little b allele spreads in the blue population and the little a allele spreads in the pink population. And then upon secondary contact, those two populations come into uh, intermix and some of their hybrids are gonna have little a, little b homozygote genotypes. And this combination of alleles has never been before tested by natural selection and can result in significant decreases in fitness and prevent further introgression. All right. So this is the tension zone model, but it doesn't really represent this example of post-glacial range expansion and hybridization I presented at the beginning. So today I wanna to propose an alternative model of secondary contact hybridization. In this model, the populations are initially separated on the far ends of a linear habitat separated by a geographical barrier, then at some point in the past, that barrier is removed. Those populations expand across space, eventually coming into secondary contact and then introgressing. 
Why might range expansion matter? Well, we know that range expansion has important genetic consequences. One particular consequence that has been studied extremely well theoretically is allele surfing. Um, and uh, when we go to describe allele surfing, uh, imagine a population that has purple and gray alleles. And so over here, I'm gonna call this the range core. And then as that population expands across space, it repeatedly colonizes new habitats. You have sequential founder effects. This decreases the effective population size, increases the amount of genetic drift, and allows alleles to fix on the range edge. So all types of alleles can fix, deleterious alleles, beneficial alleles, all those types. Um, but today I wanna focus on the fixation of recessive deleterious alleles on the range edge. Uh, why this type of allele? Well, first of all, we might expect that this type of allele is very common in the genome. Um, and Stephen Peichel and colleagues have shown that recessive deleterious alleles of moderate to uh, weak effect can accumulate readily on the range edge. So this is a traditional allele surfing model, but I wanna add something new to this to include the hybridization and say, what happens if two allele surfing populations come into secondary contact? So in this scenario, we might imagine that there are many loci in the genome where on one po parental populations, the recessive deleterious allele has fixed, and the other, the corresponding dominant beneficial allele has fixed. And then we have to ask ourselves, what happens when we cross these two populations? So let's talk about the F1 hybrids. You have a little a, little a deleterious phenotype, a homozygous big A, beneficial phenotype. And when you cross them, you have the big A allele masking that recessive deleterious allele. And this creates a beneficial phenotype and the observation of significant heterosis. So that brings us to the orienting question today. How does parental population range expansion prior to secondary contact impact the dynamics of these hybrid zones? So that's a pretty broad question. So let's break it into three smaller bits. First, does range expansion impact the heterosis that we see in F1 hybrids? Why might this be interesting? Well, we see significant variation in the amount of heterosis observed in hybrids of crop, crop plant crosses. So if expansion history can explain that heterosis, this may help us select um, populations to cross to create rigorous um, crop families. Second, does heterosis break down those reproductive barriers and promote introgression at Bates and Dogenton Miller incompatibilities? Why might this happen? Well, imagine you have that BDM Lai locus and it's linked to one of these selected loci. If it's linked, then when you hybridize, you're masking that recessive deleterious allele, and that masking might result in hitchhiking that promotes the introgression of that deleterious BDMI. So can this allele surfing actually result in the breakdown of reproductive isolation? And finally, how does this whole story depend on recombination? So Paisal et al. 2015 showed that allele surfing is critically dependent on the pattern of recombination across the chromosome. In particular, here we see a plot where they compare a scenario where you have one freely segregating chromosome to a case where you have 20 freely segregating chromosomes. And in the case where you only have a single chromosome, this can allele surfing can compound itself and significantly limit range expansion to the point that the range stops expanding at all. All right, so what do, what do we do? Well, we build a simulation-based model. So uh, in the first part, I simulate two allopatric parental populations. Uh, until they reach eco-evolutionary equilibrium. We then let those parental populations expand across the linear habitat. 
Um, during this expansion, we're going to do artificial experimental crosses so that we can study the accumulation of heterosis over the course of range expansion. And then eventually at some point, those two expanding populations are going to come into secondary contact and intergress. All right, so this figure here demonstrates some of the figures that I'm going to present in the future that are a little bit non-traditional. So let me walk you through the axes. On this axis here, we're going to have time. On the x-axis, we're going to have space. Initially, there's going to be a geographical barrier and some empty space, and then eventually they're going to come into secondary contact. All right. Second, we wanted to understand recombination. So we tried out five different recombination scenarios. We tried out a scenario where you have free recombination across the chromosome. We tried a second scenario where you have uniform constrained recombination. We tried one where you have freely segregating chromosomes. And then we tried two where you have what you would observe on average across plants and animals across a single chromosome with variation in the recombination rate across that chromosome. All right, so for the constrained chromosomal um, and the animal and plant scenario, the average recombination rate is the same. The only thing that differs is how that recombination is distributed across the chromosome. What did we find? Well, first and foremost, we should show that we see the same thing that we would expect with allele surfing. So if you compare the fitness in the range core to the fitness observed on the range edge, you can observe that we see a significant decline in fitness on the range edge due to the accumulation of these recessive deleterious alleles. This is called expansion load. And you can see that we see on average an increase in expansion load Throughout all of my plots, the light gray lines in the background are simulation replicates, and the dark line is the average. So yes, we see expansion load. But what about hybridization? What happens if we cross the, the range edge populations? Well, in this case, we see that, that the accumulation of expansion load corresponds to an accumulation of heterosis. So the pattern that we see here is characteristic of allele surfing that early on, you see a significant increase in heterosis or uh, expansion load as you burn through that standing genetic variation. And then you see a long sustained pattern that's due to new mutations. Other determinants of the amount of heterosis that we see is the strength of selection acting on those best sets of deleterious alleles. In general, the stronger selection is, the more heterosis that we'll see. But we only looked at weakly to moderately deleterious loci. And in general, this pattern is not linear. So as you increase the amount of selection, every time you mask one of those alleles, the more of a benefit it gives you. However, the stronger selection is, the harder it is for that allele to surf because the more drift has to overcompensate for the uh, overcome. So we see this nonlinear relationship between the strength of selection and the amount of heterosis that accumulates in F1 hybrids. So finally, to just fill out the rest of this picture, we compared a case where we have fully recessive to individuals that are partially recessive with an H of 0 0.25. And you can see that with partially recessive, you just get part of the response. All right. The other thing that matters is a BDMI. So if you have a dominant BDMI, so a BDMI where all of the hybrid hybrids are gonna have that uh, deleterious effect, you see this dramatic um, reduction in the amount of heterosis. And this isn't really surprising. It's just due to the fact that you are um, canceling out a bunch of that heterosis with the effect of that BDMI. All right. So yes, expansion load can lead to heterosis. But what does this mean for introgression? Well, here I have a plot of fitness across that map that I showed you earlier. The black is the empty space and you see these populations expanding. And then once they come into con secondary contact, the cool thing here is that they create this triangle of high fitness where you're seeing the long-term effects 
of this heterosis playing out across the range as those individuals intergress. So uh, just like in the tension zone model, we can look at allele frequency clines across space. So here I show you a plot of the allele frequency cline at one of those selected loci across the range. The black is at the 10th generation after introgression. And then it gets, as you progress through the colors, you progress through introgression. And we see some marked differences from the tension zone model. First and foremost, the tension zone model predicts stigmoidal clines. So where you're fixed in one patch and fixed in the other. This is no longer true when you incorporate allele surfing. Oops. So if you incorporate allele surfing, you'll be fixed in one parental patch. But in the other parental patch, you might have a pretty low frequency still in the range core, but it's only allele surfing that increases the frequency on the range edge. And so I'm going to call these secant clines. Um, we can talk about why if you want. Um, but allele surfing changes the shape of these clines. However, the same thing happens in the long term. As you go to evolutionary equilibrium, the frequency drops, and eventually the beneficial allele will fix across the range. All right, so what are the consequences of this cline shape for further study of the uh, hybrid zone. Well, that Klein shape can also impact neutral loci, which are used to understand population ancestry. To understand the consequences of this, let's go back to the tension zone model and look at our expectations there. So in the tension zone model, you have this stigmoidal cline of allele frequency, and then as time proceeds, you have a slow and steady introgression of those alle neutral alleles. What this corresponds to is a very clear definition of where the, the hybrid zone is by looking at the population ancestry. So you can build a likelihood model of predicting um, which portion of an of a individual belongs to each parental species, and you get this nice climb in population ancestry. This no longer works in the, in the post-expansion hybridization model because of this secant shape and this decrease in allele frequency or increase in allele frequency in the parental populations. Instead, we see almost a linear uh, shift in the, in the parental ancestry from one range core to the other range core. This suggests that if we want to study post-expansion hybridization, we're going to have to come up with different and more complicated measures of population ancestry to identify where in the range this hybrid zone is. All right, what's what? going on with the BDMI? Well, the BDMI significantly decreases fitness in the point of secondary context. So here I show the reduction in fitness due to that BDMI. And you can see that particularly in populations early on in secondary contact, there's a significant decrease in fitness. Over here, I show you a comparison of the clines at neutral loci and selected loci to the cline and allele frequency at the BDMI locus. And what I want to point out here is that the slope, the width of this BDMI cline is not a whole lot more uh, steep than at the neutral locus, at least early on in introgression. So is this indicating that those selected alleles are actually helping introgression? And indeed they are. So if we vary the strength of selection acting on those deleterious recessive alleles, then masking of those alleles can promote introgression. And the stronger selection is, the more they promote introgression. But the effect of this depends on uh, recombination. So if we have more and more constrained recombination and more and more heterogeneity in recombination across the chromosome, the stronger the effect of hitchhiking of deleterious recessive alleles with the BDMIs can promote introgression. All right, so that brings me to the conclusion of my talk that we have learned that you cannot model post-expansion hybridization simply with the tension zone model and that allele surfing and these expansion dynamics can play an important role. In particular, 
Range expansion can promote heterosis, and this could explain significant amounts of the variation potentially in observed amounts of heterosis in natural systems. Allele surfing also will impact our inference of population ancestry and future work on, on post-expansion hybridization is gonna have to incorporate much more complex models of population ancestry to accurately infer where those hybrid zones are. Finally, the masking of deleterious alleles and the linkage between those deleterious alleles and BDMI loci can promote introgression at the BDMI loci break down reproductive barriers and may have important consequences for species barriers. So if you want to check out this work, it's now posted in the American Naturalist. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and ask for questions. We have a few minutes for a couple of questions. Hey, I, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, sorry, I'm Andy Kern from University of Oregon. Um, this is so this is really neat because you're putting together, or in my eyes, this is really neat because you're putting together issues of space and fitness and whatnot. And there are a lot of messy details sort of at that intersection. So I wonder if I could pick your brain about some of the details here. So for instance, how do you deal with um, boundaries? Yeah, so uh, we just have reflecting boundaries in the range core, but this isn't actually that important. So as long as the range core isn't too small, that range core is going to be very close to mutation selection balance. And so we tested different sizes of range cores. And unless you get to like extremely small population sizes in the range core, you it won't have much of an impact. Okay. And so that's my second question is, um, how did you deal with with local population density regulation here? Yes. So we have a logistic model, eco-evolutionary model here. Um, and so you do have these compounding effects of founder events. Um, there's a whole cool other story here about R versus K selection and in, in, in its impacts, but that's a story for a different talk in a different paper. So, so I mean, maybe, but I'm wondering what, what the, so how much extinction do you see here? So I ran like 2,000 simulations, and I only saw extinction three times in the range four, and I did throw, throw out those three cases. Um, but it, it was the accumulation of deleterious recessives at mutation selection drift balance was not really enough to drive extinction. Cool. Thanks. Hi. Alex Fournier-Level, the University of Melbourne. Thank you so much for the enlightening talk. Um, how would you infer the shape over space of your surfing response? Do you expect systematic linearity? Do you expect changes of regime? Or do you expect maybe an exponential end of response? So in population ancestry or allele frequency? Allele frequency. In allele frequency, um, so it was very phenomenological. So why I call it a secant client is it just happens to be approximately the shape of a derivative of a secant. <laughs> so I just fit in a, that shape to it. Um, and uh, it, so I had a, a goodness of fit and it was reasonably well fit, but it's completely phenomenological. Um, it would be really cool to come up with a mechanistic reason why that shape occurs, but and? that was not here. No, no, no I don't have it. Intuition. No, I don't have an intuition for, I mean, other than the surfing shape, um, I think it's a complex story with the amount of selection and the amount of recombination. And I would love to dig into that, but yeah. Okay, thank, thank you very much, Eileen. Our next speaker is Jacob Steenwick. Okay, awesome. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, again, thank you for introducing this section. My name is Jacob. I see a lot of new faces here, so I thought I'd take some time to introduce who I am. Um, large part of who I am is has been inspired and supported by my family, so I'd like to acknowledge them first. My parents, Howard and Mercy, are actually in the audience, so mom, dad, thank you very much for being here. <laughs> That was really awesome. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> um, I also want to acknowledge my sisters, Emily and Nina, as well as my brother-in-laws, Josh and Gary. And these folks have in part inspired me to try and be more than just a scientist. And one way I've tried to do that is to open this SciArt shop, which is this Art for Earth initiative. And what I'm trying to do here is enable people a mechanism to purchase with purpose because 100% of the profits go towards global conservation efforts, and I've raised around $2,000 thus far. So it's not really about what exactly is being sold, but the images being shown on them. They are these Andy Warhol style portraits of endangered organisms, and it's my attempt to raise awareness about them, as well as in a very fantasized sense, immortalize these endangered species. I am a fungal biologist or a mycologist, and so I've also made portraits of organisms that I think are fascinating for one reason or, not, or another. So this is the fly agaric oyster mushroom and morel. And it was a huge honor when one of the portraits I made was cover, was on the feature or the cover of Yeast Magazine. And I got to write this accompanying article of, that was really calling for a reunification of the arts and sciences, because what I think they offer together is much more uh, is much greater than what they offer individually. Okay, so I'm obviously interested in fungi, and this is in part because I think that they're so interesting in the way that they're this like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde type of kingdom. And so it's not just about the phenotypic um, diversity that we see in the in the kingdom of two to five million different fungal species, but it's that a lot of them are really great for human welfare. We use them in food production, industrial fermentations, et cetera. And then some of them are very bad for human welfare. They're plant pathogens, human pathogens. And in a warming world, the niche of these organisms is expanding and giving rise to new multi-drug pathogens such as Candida auris. So I think part of the reason that they have such variation in lifestyle is due to evolutionary rate variation in the kingdom. So if we look at evolutionary rate variation in chordates shown here, and we use branch lengths, which represents substitutions per site as a proxy of evolutionary rate, we can see chordates have very short branch lengths. But when we contrast that to fungi, fungi have super long branch lengths. They're evolving quite rapidly, in part due to a shorter generation time and many other factors. And we can even see one outlier kind of going beyond the, the circular um, structure shown on the outside. So I think for anyone who's studied phylogenetics and evolutionary genomics, there's always a challenge with tools to help us make sense of all of this evolutionary rate variation or genetic variation. And that, that again, is a challenge that many of us, if not all of us, has, have faced. So I've tried to develop software for the life sciences with a focus on evolutionary genetic and evolutionary genomic analyses. And these are seven different software that I've published so far that are freely available to anyone and everyone. Um, I want to share with you just one of them and then talk a little bit more about a different one. And the first one I want to share with you is called ClipKit. It's this alignment trimming toolkit. So it functions as part of a typical phylogenetic pipeline where you align homologous sequences, you trim that alignment, and then you reconstruct the evolutionary history of those sequences. So ClipKit functions at that trimming alignment step. The whole reason that alignments are typically trimmed is that you want to remove highly divergent sites because it's thought that they're highly divergent due to erroneously inferred site homology or they lack any sort of phylogenetic signal due to saturation by multiple substitutions. And this has been the practice for 30 years or so um, since Lake published it in 1991, as far as I could tell. However, in 2015, it was shown that these methods were actually resulting in worse single gene phylogenetic inferences. So they weren't performing as well as we once thought. And the take home message put forth by these authors was that the more aggressive the trimmer, meaning the more sites it removed, the worse it performed. 
So they didn't go to say this, but it really suggests that a lot of these methods are actually removing sites with phylogenetic signal, sites with phylogenetic certainty, so to speak. And so this really calls for an alternative alignment trimming strategy. So I decided to, to flip the logic, wherein instead of removing uncertain sites, which is very grayly defined depending on which software you look at, what if we just focused on retaining sites, which we know a lot more about, that have phylogenetic certainty or signal? Okay, so that's really the crux of how ClipKit works. It has various different modes just to explain how one of them works. ClipKit will look at an alignment, classify each site as parsimony informative or not, and keep those that are parsimony informative. Okay, it's a very simple idea, but it performs surprisingly well. So if we rank it against other alignment trimming software based off of tree topology accuracy and tree support, ClipKit and its various different modes, which have a blue star above it, outperform other methods in a rank-based scheme where ranking first is you know, coming in first place and 12th is last place. And the best performing is on the left, the worst is on the right. So ClipKit works well. And part of my mission is to make these tools accessible to everyone. So I've teamed up with a uh, biotech company in the Bay Area called Latch Bio to provide my toolkits and others, um, depending on the license availability, in the web browser. So people can now just click around, upload files to their web brace cloud computing platform, specify the name of their output file, customize parameters, et cetera, and align uh, uh, and trim alignments in the browser with ease. Okay, and then the next thing I wanna share with you today really brings me to the heart of the talk that I'll spend around 10 minutes or, or so on. And it's an, author, or an orthologous gene coevolution network and how it provides insight into eukaryotic cellular genomic structure and function. Long title, but what it really has to do with is the holy grail in bioinformatics. And that's how can we determine gene function when we don't really have that much information, but the gene itself, for example. So I think we can all agree that this is a grand challenge in biology. And we've seen many figures just like this one here today, where if we have some sort of understanding of genotypic space, some sort of understanding of phenotypic space, how can we start to map out those genotype to phenotype relationships? One way to map out these G to P relationships is through determining or identifying genetic interactions. And this occurs when a double mutant has an unexpected phenotype compared to a single mutant. The Brenda Andrews and Charlie Boone's labs at University of Toronto have really demonstrated the power of this method in Saccharomyces cerevisiae and generated many diagenic knockouts, phenotyped them all, and created these hairball-like like networks that display um, a wiring diagram of cellular function. So here nodes represent genes and edges connect two genes with a significant genetic interaction. And in the colorful part of the figure, you can see different neighborhoods of the network reflect different functional modules, such as mRNA processing, DNA replication and repair, so on and so forth. To give you an example of two genes that have a significant genetic interaction, there's PEX1 and PEX6. They physically interact, they're involved in the same function and disruption of their ability to physically interact leads to neurologic disorders such as Zellweger syndrome in humans. So if we were to take like a 10,000 foot view of what exactly a genetic interaction is, it's so powerful because it allows us to identify genes with shared function. There is of course that huge hurdle, which is why it took two labs and multiple years to do this work which is generating all of those diagenic knockouts is super hard and not really something that's gonna be accessible for many other people. There's a different method out there that gets at similar but distinct information. And that's gene coevolution or covariation. And this refers to when two genes covary in parallel across speciation events. It's something that's observed when genes share function, they're co-expressed or they're part of the same multimeric complexes and this is a, a, something that one of the other toolkits that I published in bioinformatics can calculate for you in a high throughput manner. So what exactly it does is it looks at a collection of gene trees and it looks for something called the mirror principle. And that's when two gene trees mirror one another in their branch lengths across speciation events. So gene A and B mirror one, each, one another very well. They have very similar tree shapes. However, the pairwise combinations of gene A and C 
as well as gene B and D do not mirror one another very well. So skipping over mathematical corrections and transformations, it's kind of like doing a correlation of branch lengths between two phylogenies. And again, this is something that's observed in genes that share function, they're co-expressed, they're part of the same multimeric complexes. So it's kind of like genes of a feather evolve together. And if this is really true, does that mean that we can use just coevolutionary information alone to draw one of these network diagrams of cellular function? And that's exactly what I set out to test. I used the Saccharomycotina data set, which is the subphylum of budding yeast. And so the phylogeny of 332 genomes that we have available is shown on the left side. I've pointed out some iconic species, including Saccharomyces, Hensinia spora, Candida, and Britannomyces. Across all of these genomes, we have a dense sampling of orthologs, 2,400 exactly. And um, across every pairwise combination, I calculated gene covariation or coevolution, so around 3 million pairwise combinations. Using a very robust, um, strict threshold of what I considered coevolution, I found that there is actually not that many instances of coevolution between pairwise combinations of genes. So 60,000 significant signatures of coevolution versus the 2.8 million of gene pairs that did not have significant signatures of coevolution. To give you an example of two genes that are strongly co-evolving, there's PEX1 and PEX6. So in this plot, each dot is a branch length in the species tree, and you can see how they are correlating very nicely. If you recall, these are the two genes where if their physical interaction is disrupted in humans, it causes Zellweger syndrome. So next, I took those 60,000 significant signatures of coevolution and constructed one of these networks kind of a la Costanzo et al. And the way that I did that is much like their networks. I had nodes represent genes, and I drew edges between two genes that were significantly co-evolving. And I just continued to add more and more genes onto the network. And we found instances where genes weren't really co-evolving with any other genes. So I just kind of stuck them on the outside of the network for this toy example, gene C and gene D. So that global network looks like the following, where we have this halo of genes that aren't really co-evolving with any others, and then a more hairball-like structure in the middle. And again, nodes are genes and edges connect genes that are co-evolving. And from this network, I wanna share with you two key insights. One of which is that it actually provides us with this hierarchy of insight into uh, cellular and genomic structure and function, and it really changes the way at least I look at a genome and suggests that it's this extensively linked ensemble of genes. So to the first point, um, how this network provides insight into cellular structure and function, the first thing we wanted to test is whether there's any sort of biological information encoded in the network. One easy way to start to get a sense of that is just to look at the number of co-evolving genes for every gene. So there's a median of eight. However, there's an incredibly long positive skew in this distribution. And when we look at genes that are co-evolving with over 400 others, we find that they're enriched in chromatin remodelers or other genes that tend to impact a lot of different types of genes and their functions as well. So this suggests to us that basic features of the network kind of have some biological information encoded in them. We wanted to dig into this further and detect bona fide subnetworks within the network, also known as communities for the network biologists. And these tend to have more connections within them than between two dis distinct communities. So each community is colored in a different color. And um, each color was enriched in its own set of biological processes, for example, Golgi vesicle transport. So it's still a very broad view of how the network captures cellular genomic structure and function, but we can start to zoom in even further and again, uh, get at that sort of hierarchy of function encoded in the network. For example, for example, we can look at reflections of cellular structure in the network. So when we look at um, where genes encode proteins and where those proteins function, we see that there's a lot of genes that are co-evolving with others that um, function in the nucleus or function in the cytoplasm. We can also appreciate the intimate relationship between genes that are co-evolving in each cellular compartment. And we can even see how they're kind of bridged by spliceosomal genes, which we found very interesting. 
We can start to zoom in again even further and look at specific bioprocesses, and we'll find more coevolution than expected by random chance in a given bioprocess. I'm just showing DNA replication as one example. We can also see more coevolution in specific biomolecules than expected by random chance. Here I'm highlighting the MCM helicase as just one example. So for this first point, um, from bioprocesses to biomolecules, the coevolutionary network really does seem to provide this insight into a hierarchy of cellular function, and it provides similar but distinct and I would say complementary information um, compared to genetic interaction networks. But I think what's really amazing here is that we're just using evolutionary information and not functional data. So this is all, all of these insights are just gleaned solely from looking at patterns of evolution um, without any sort of functional data. And that's, that's one, of, one of the things that I think is the true power of this method. Okay, for the second insight, um, what I wanna talk about is how the network portrays the genome as this extensively linked ensemble of genes. So we have some priors about what to expect when we project the network onto the genome structure of an organism. From this Nature Genetics Reviews Genetics article by Hurst et al., um, they discuss the evolutionary dynamics of eukaryotic gene order, and they kind of summarize the following points, one of which is that gene order in eukaryotes is not random, and genes with similar or coordinated expressions, things that are involved in the same pathway, things that belong to the same multimeric complex, they tend to be physically linked. And that sounds very similar to the type of things that a genetic interaction would pick up or gene coevolution would pick up. So they posit that understanding how genes cluster is really critical to our understanding of how chromosomes function and how they evolve. So just to give you two examples of iconic metabolic gene clusters, there's the nitrate assimilation pathway in Ogatea, and then um, the gliotoxin metabolic gene cluster in Aspergillus fumigatus, which is responsible for biosynthesizing a toxic secondary metabolite. So equipped with this information, we hypothesize, well, then co-evolving genes should be physically linked or proximal to one another. And the way that we examined this was to project the network onto the genome structure of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So these are the 16 chromosomes of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. These are the genes on the plus and minus strand of this uh, organism's genome. The genes within our data set, the 2400 orthologs, are nicely distributed across the whole genome. We can add in more information, such as the scatter plot, which shows the number of co evolving genes per gene. The larger the dot, the more co evolving genes that gene is um, evolving with. And then we can draw links from, say, chromosome one to any other gene it's co evolving with. So we see that genes on chromosome one are co evolving with genes on every other chromosome for Saccharomyces cerevisiae. We find the exact same thing for Candida albicans. However, it has a much bigger chromosome one with more genes. And so it's a more hairball-like, more entangled uh, view of coevolution. And I have not cherry-picked these chromosomes. We can just take a look at each and every one. Two minutes. Thank you. Yeah, we can take a look at every single one and see extensive interchromosomal coevolution. All right, so this is the qualitative view. We can take a quantitative view and see that there's much more coevolution between chromosomes than there is within chromosomes. And I want to highlight NO80, the chromatin remodeler, remodeler that I remarked on before, because it is co-evolving by itself with genes across the entire genome for both of these organisms. So again, I think that this result really provides an entangled view of the genome and how it functions. Okay, so to summarize, the insights are, um, as I see it, like a genetic interaction network, coevolution networks provide insight into gene function, and they portray, again, the genome as this extensively linked ensemble of genes, but there are some technical advantages that are noteworthy. For example, this required months and not years of effort, and these insights, again, were inferred via evolutionary rather than functional data, um, so it makes it more accessible to people, in my opinion. So I want to leave you with this one question, and I think everyone in this room has been interested in a gene or a pathway at one point in their career, and I want to ask whether or not signatures of gene coevolution could provide an additional layer of insight into those genes or pathways that you're interested in, and I'm willing to go out on a limb and say yes, it absolutely can. So with that, um, I'd like to thank present and past Rokas Lab members where I did my 
uh, doctoral studies at Vanderbilt University, as well as thank different teams that contributed to parts of this that made it all work. You know, the software team, the team that sequenced and assembled all of these yeast genomes, as well as the team specific towards that coevolution network project. Thank you, and I'd take I'd be happy to take any questions. Hi, great talk. Uh, I'm Stephen from UW Madison. I'm really curious about if you, so here you're looking at gene tree to study, uh, to, to build this network. So it, what if you look at the population tree within the species, is it possible to like construct a gene tree of within species populations to study co-adaptation of genes? Yeah, um, I've never seen anyone that has done that. The only trick would be that you'll have a lot of branch lengths of zero length. Right. And so correlations with, with a lot of values of zero kind of just throw things off there. So I think it's worthy to look into, but we would have to consider that caveat very closely. Yeah. Right. right. Thanks. Thanks, you. Hi, I'm Chris McAllister, also at UW Madison. Um, I wanted to ask, you talked about generating community clusters based on the connectivity metric uh, from your coevolution network. Uh, is there a connectivity um, per, like point at which the community clusters you generate have highest similarity to the, because it's not that at all, uh, clustering? Yeah. Um... So yeah, whether or not our community clustering kind of reflected the Costanzo at all clustering, um, it, it did reflect it. This is where it gets similar, but distinct. Okay. So for our network, we had genes that had undergone whole genome duplication and genes that hadn't undergone whole genome duplication. Whereas Costanzo, you know, they're just dealing with one strain in one species really. So those were where we found a lot of differences where evolutionary histories were absolutely different. Um, using whole genome duplication as one example. But broadly speaking, we found that there was a striking similarity between the two networks. Thank you. Hi, I'm Grant Kinsler. I'm a graduate student uh, with Dimitri Petrov at Stanford. And I was curious, I guess, also about comparison with the Constanzo kind of approach. Um, is, you know, I wonder if there's like certain types of genetic interactions that are easier or harder to pick up with this kind of approach. Like I expect maybe like, proteins that are physically interacting might be easier to pick up with this approach than maybe other types of genetic interactions? Yeah, certainly. That's a great question. Um, a lot of this work, you know, I stand on the shoulders of giants. So Nathan Clark and Chippa Quadro, they really demonstrated the power of this method and they showed that physically interacting genes and, you know, genes that are co-expressed, this can all drive signatures of co-evolution. I think just how tight their importance is will be reflected in how strong that evolution co-evolutionary signature is so i think at that point it might mostly depend on how you decide where that threshold of significant co-evolution is we we chose a very strict one thank you grant uh hello um i'm julia from the university of british columbia and my question to you is about click uh particularly about the performance metrics that you were using so uh, do you mind expanding a little bit more um, uh, on that? I have a colleague that just implemented ClipKit and replaced it. Uh, uh, sorry, it was, it was replacing uh, BMGE. So I was wondering what the differences in performance between those two tools are and what you would expect if you were to compare those two. Is it mostly computational? time or are the alignments better quality with them? Yeah. yeah so it's the question is specifically about bmge and clipkit bmge is an entropy based trimmer so it removes highly divergent sites because they're they have more entropy um and so we found that a lot of these highly divergent sites which are often parsimony informative contain a lot of phylogenetic signal in them so when you remove based off of entropy, you're removing a lot of these phylogenetically uh, significant or, or, or sites with a lot of phylogenetic signal. So ClipKit will just keep a lot of what BMGE removes. BMGE is also really, really aggressive. So it can remove like two thirds, three fourths of an alignment 
and you're just removing a lot of information when you do that. Do you think that would be particularly a problem when you're trying to look at particularly short genes where you may not necessarily have a lot to work with and you wind up removing a lot of the phylogenetic markers on those shorter genes? Uh, yeah, I think it definitely becomes problematic. I think, you know, when you can, just don't trim at all. Yeah. <laughs> and um, when you need to do like phylogenomic analyses, trimming is worth it because you save a lot of time. Yeah. Okay. Th thanks. We need to move on to the next speaker. Um, thank you very much, Jamie. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bo Xia. Hi, um, it's my great pleasure to come here and introduce some of the work uh, happened at the end stage of my uh, PhD. I'm Bo from NYU and um, as suggested by our organizers, I'm putting a picture of myself without a mask. Uh, and also more importantly here is uh, you will see me, like all of you, are quite different from the living species that are evolutionarily close to us. So this, uh, this reminds us of this very curious question, probably one of the um, most uh, like ultimate curiosity of human being. What genetic changes made us, human be made us human during evolution? So for me, as a training background from genetics, this, to answer this question is to identify the genetics then underline the specific traits, no matter it's simple gene or complex, uh, complex traits. So, uh, going from this, there are many different kinds of uh, human traits we are interested, like the enlargement of the brain, how we stand up. But for me, uh, I'm going to focus on a specific trait, that is the loss of the tail. It's a lot unique to human, but also in, our, uh, in the living species that are close to us, or the apes. So this, um, this is a trait that happened around, happened around like 20 to 25 million years ago when the uh, homeloids diverge from the old world monkeys. So um, this answers the very first question, which is a simple one. When did the homeloids lose their tail during evolution? Then comes to the, to the key, key question is, how did homeloids lock their tail during evolution? Or more genetically, what is the genetic basis of the tail loss evolution? The, um, the, reason, the, the reason why that mot motivates me to really chase for this answer is like a few months before the pandemic, I had a bad, very bad injury that hurt my tailbone. That tailbone like really reminds me, like whenever I sit down, I can feel that. If someone had the same experience, then you will, you will know it. So like that pain always reminds me to think about this question. So go to the literature, to look for look for the answers. Um, the the um, the good part is uh, we still have this developmental program in our genome. Like this is the um, this is a lab of uh, human embryonic development uh, on Carnegie stage uh, thirteen to twenty three, and and the, on Carnegie stage uh, fourteen to sixteen we still have quite a lot of uh, caudosomites, which is uh, which uh, should contribute to the to the tail. But we don't have that. That's because this developmental program was perturbed uh, by some kinds of um, uh, developmental events that prevents a tail from elongation. So we, long, we no longer have the ex external tail, but just remaining four to five caudal vertebrae in, inside our body. So, um, but the good part is we still have this developmental program. We just need to find out what's, uh, what's the changes perturbs this uh, developmental program. So uh, we can infer from the existing um, uh, from existing animal models where they used to have a tail, but because of a specific mutation, they lost it. There are quite many genes uh, involved in this uh, in tail in development. One of the very early uh, one of the very early model is uh, is identified by a very early scientist, Martin Dabrowski Lewowski. She, um, she identified a mutant mouse where they no longer develop uh, a tail. This mutant is called T, which stands for tailless. 
And later, like around uh, in early 1990s, um, this, uh, this mutant was uh, mapped to a gene called BRCA, later uh, renamed as uh, TBXT. So this, the mutation of this gene leads to the uh, tail loss in mouse and uh, also in many other species. One of the most famous uh, animal model is uh, called the Max cat, which is uh, from the Isle of Man in the Irish Sea of UK. This kind of cat breed, they, um, uh, one of the characteristics of this cat is they don't have a tail. And when, you, when we map the mutation of this cat, it's happened to the same gene, TBXT. So I was curious to look at you know, what, uh, if there's anything changed, anything happening to the homeloid TBXT gene. And what's very surprising to me is, I, uh, when I'm looking at the, the genes across apes and also monkeys, I found a very interesting uh, inversion in the intron. This inversion is a transposable element called alu element. So it's happening at the middle of this intron. So uh, if you are not familiar, alu element, which is a type of transposable element, it's very frequent in our genome. It has over 1 million copies, occupying more than 10% of our genome. It's only 300 base pair, um, but they have a preference to invert it in the intron. So you may wonder, um, what could then happen, one single mutation happen in the intron of a gene? But what makes this alu element or alu Y element in TBXT really interesting is it can uh, have a potential interaction with the existing alu element called alu SX1. So these two elements, they're they are, uh, they are um, forming in the inverse repeat pair and with the exon sitting in between of these two elements. So when I see these two alu elements, what came up in my mind is they can possibly form a stem loop structure when they're in pre mr stage because they share a pretty high sequence similarity. So this really brings me uh, a hypothesis to test Possibly this alu Y element is driving the uh, tail loss in humans and apes. Because of this alu Y element in, uh, in the homeloid TBXT gene, these two pair with each other and they, introduce, and they induce a autonomous splicing events that's generating two different isoforms of TBXT. One is Follens, the other one is Data Exon 6 transcript. But in other monkeys where they don't have this alu Y element, they can only generate a full length transcript. This might be the, uh, the case that prevents us from developing a tail. So I'm gonna test this hypothesis. Um, so a little bit more information of TBXT. It's a transcription factor. It binds to the very well-known T, uh, T motif and it forms a, a dimer. And this protein and the n terminus it's a DNA binding, to, uh, binding domain, and the C terminus, it's a transcriptional regulation domain. And this exon six is sitting uh, on the C terminus. And, um, uh, with, uh, and deleting this exon six, it's still, uh, it's still a in-frame transcript, which gives them a functional but shorter protein. So I'm guessing that possibly because of this autonomous splicing, this, uh, this transcription factor is no longer functional and they may perturb its downstream transcriptional regulation function. So uh, I'm gonna test this hypothesis and see whether uh, this Aluwai element inversion and the effect induced by this inversion will lead to the uh, different phenotype. So first, as a sanity check, in human, we have like this two, uh, human TBXT, we have these two Alu elements, but mouse, there's nothing. And um, using uh, in vitro differentiation of the embryonic stem cell to induce expression of TBXT, and also uh, and then do the RT-PCR, we'll see that human TBXT express these two uh, isoforms. One is Follens, the other one is Data Exon Six, shorter transcript. But mouse only have one, and the Sanger sequencing definitely uh, detect this exon skipping events from the human TBXT gene, which is good. And now I can test whether this alu Y element inversion in the intron will need really the causal mechanism of uh, inducing this alternative splicing. So what I can do is using CRISPR to remove this alu Y element so that to um, detect whether this still can uh, uh, perform this kind of autonomous splicing. Or alternatively, we can remove this alu S element, which is an interacting counterpart 
and then see whether they can still do the adrenal splicing. So uh, as you can see, uh, still the wild type, they have the two isoforms. When I delete the allo Y element, uh, allo Y element in the uh, TBXT, the shorter, uh, shorter isoform disappeared, which indicates that um, the atonal splicing requires this intronic allo Y element. Remember, they are in the very middle of the intron. They are not like adjacent to a splicing site. So it's really like we are, when we are perturbing this very middle intronic sequence, they lost this autonomous splicing potential. And same thing when we perturb this uh, alu S element, which is in the laboring intron, still in the middle of the intron, they no longer have this uh, uh, shorter transcript, but only the uh, full length transcript. This, uh, and this experiment supports a uh, supports model that um, even though human and um, more broadly, the homeloid TBXT gene has a full, uh, has a full uh, components of the coding region of TBXT, but because of autonomous splicing, which derived from this Y element inversion, we are generating two different isoforms. One is full length, the other one because of the uh, intronic, um, intronic uh, uh, stimulus structure that generates a shorter isoform. So then uh, what, you know, what we are gonna test is, um, again, using, using human mouse as a, as a comparison, like human, because of autonomous splicing, we are having these two isoforms, but mouse, they, they can only generate this full length transcripts. What if we generate a mouse that express both the full length transcripts, but also the data exon six transcript? This will mimic the, uh, the case in human or broadly to the homeloids that are uh, expressing the two different isoform of TBXT gene. To do this, uh, because mouse, they don't have any allo elements. So what we can do is um, very straightforwardly delete this exon, and, but in a heterodigous way. Then the mouse, this mouse will produce, uh, will, uh, will have one allele being the wild type, which uh, will produce the full length transcripts. The other allele deleting this exon six will generating a shorter isoform, which is a data exon six transcript. So then uh, we use the, 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 got, uh, the, got, uh, the got injection of the CRISPR reactions, targeting this, uh, targeting the mouse TPXT gene, removing this exon six. And then um, transfer this uh, CRISPR targeted zygotes to the to the uterus of the uh, hosting mother, so that to generate a screen for a heterozygous mouse where they have the, uh, the where they simultaneously expressing the full length and the their exosix transcripts. Um, we successfully got a few um, uh, got a few founder nice. This is probably some of the easy uh, developmental genetics animal model because you immediately see the phenotypes when once they are born, and this mouse have like very uh, uh, very um, tail phenotypes. They can be uh, have absolute low tail, which is uh, our expectation. They can also have short tail, and as a control, the wild type from the same leader, uh, they are still having the long tails. This results support that simultaneously expressing a full length and the third axon six transcript will be able to induce a um, no tail phenotype, which supports our initial hypothesis that um, this might be the genetic basis for, for us to losing the tail during evolution. Of course, uh, when we are breed, you know, breeding this uh, founder line mouse to, uh, to, have, uh, to have a more quantitative understanding of how this phenotype will be like, there will be very uh, phenotypes. They can be uh, absolute low tail. They can also be like short tails. And some of them have king tail and the tip of the tail, or some of them still have uh, long tails. Uh, quantifying them, this uh, heterodigous, data exon six uh, heterodigous mouse, around one third of them have tail phenotypes. And the homologous mutation there, uh, no, we didn't get any because it, they are lethal. Um, and of course, wild type, they only have the long tails. And this, and this brings us to think about the process during uh, homeloid evolution in the very, uh, like around 20 million years ago. Probably like there's some uh, seeding events where a mutation is happening that perturbs the tail uh, development, possibly being a low Y element inserting in, uh, uh, in TBX teaching, we don't know. 
but and this this is this might be a key genetic changes that's happening during a uh, hominid evolution and possibly again uh, that early homloids may have very uh, tail phenotype and some other genetic changes may come together to uh, to act together with the Y inversion to fix this no tail phenotype. Um, could it be possible? Um, like because we don't have the time machine to really look at the uh, to study the samples from the early homloids, but we can test it from animal models uh, available to us. So um, what's been what's been very interesting is when I was generating this uh, Delta X6 uh, mouse, I accidentally got a mouse uh, which I still don't know exactly what the mutation is like in this one. It has uh, it uh, no matter this uh, unknown mut uh, mutant has a uh, full length tail. Uh, uh, sorry, in uh, homozygous or um, heterozygous. What I'm saying. And this is on lower mutation is I have a marker to tell this one is a mutant, but I don't know exactly what other mutation this um, this uh, specific mouse has. But uh, when I cross this one to the Delta Exon 6 uh, heterodigous mouse, and once this on lower mutation and the Delta Exon 6 um, mutation in TBXT are crossed together, this mouse completely lost their tail I, I got uh, a bunch of them and they are all uh, alive and they are absolutely low tail, which means like, uh, which indicates that you just need two mutations. They can give you a very uh, stable low tail phenotype. Mm, this even won't be exactly the same in homeloids. It could be uh, an, a, a totally different kinds of mutation in homeloids that gives us an absolute low tail phenotype. Exactly on what that mutation in homeloids will be like, I don't know, but I hope like in the near future we'll be able to identify that additional mutation that act together with the alu Y element inversion in TBXT. So um, with this, uh, we talked about when homeloid, uh, when homeloids lost their tail during evolution, it's happening around uh, 20 million years ago. We talked about how Homeloids lose their tail during evolution. In uh, one key genetic change is the uh, low Y element inversion in TBXT, which in, 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 in the intron of this TB, of this gene. And another very interesting question is why homeloids lose their tail. This relates to um, uh, when the mutation is happening, how they are adapting to the uh, environment, or what kind of uh, what kind of um, uh, advantages they may acquire from losing the tail. Uh, again, this is a very uh, challenging question that we cannot, uh, that and this like uh, I cannot answer it right now. But what's been very interesting is the tail loss is happening concurrently with the with the um, uh, with the homeloids that they acquire a more orthograde locomotion posture. Or when you are looking, when you are observing the uh, the living homeloids, they tend to stand up. They tend to uh, uh, they tend to use their two hind limbs to support the whole body, and that that's been quite different compared to other monkeys. Uh, and this and this evolution also facilitates with uh, some of the adaptation to the pelvis bone. Um, so one very wild wild hypothesis that I would uh, propose is what if the tail loss is uh, uh, is associating with the also great bipedal or bipedal locomotion style? Two minutes. Um, so what what if uh, like this the genetics? Don't forget TBXT is a, a transcription factor. They may uh, they affect the um, the posterior part of the body uh, during embryonic development. What if this uh, mutation is affecting the development, for example, to the hind limb or to the pelvis bone, that may give us some hints and more importantly, a testable uh, animal model to see whether the tail loss is associating with the also great posture. So that's gonna be a very interesting question as a follow-up. I hope to share more uh, by um, in, in, in the future, uh, experience, then we can share, we can know more about how the tail loss is connecting with the also grip and bipedal locomotion. So with this, I would like to thank my two PhD mentors, Itai Yanai and Jeff Buka, 
who really unreserved their support for me to pursue this very wild project in the late stage of my PhD. And also this work cannot be done without the help from many collaborators, especially San Yang King and uh, Wei Min Zhang, who helped me a lot about the uh, animal experiments. And then Ryan uh, sued Alex, Emily, Hannah, and Gavin and Mayen for helping me with the uh, uh, with the uh, um, uh, mouse embryonic stem cell experiments, as well as Alex and Jeremy who helped me with uh, um, analyzing the mouse embryos. So with this, I would be very happy to take more questions. Thank you. Hi, this is Xian Lan from USDIS. What you want to talk? So I guess that my question is that your results show that a loop uh, X, SX also is an essential component with a loop, a loop Y. The question is that when did that a loop SX insertion happen? You, you, have you looked at that? When is a loop SX inserted in the genome? Um, during the evolution time, yeah. Yeah. So the alu SX one element that is shared by uh by all the existing um uh, primates, which uh, which uh, an alu element itself is uh is only in the pri uh, present in in the primates. So that will be estimated to be around like uh six uh, six million years ago, sixty million years ago, because this this one is really shared by all the primates, including us, and uh, and also other monkeys. Then one is already there in the TBXD gene, yeah. So is that, I mean, is it, these two insertion is a kind of more formed like by hybridization or like a sequential insertion in your opinion, I mean like. Uh, sorry, could you so, please so, go closer to the mic? I'm oh, sorry. So mm. these two insertions, right? LUSX1, LUY1. So in your opinion, is that this insertion happened like sequentially or like independently formed but hybridization together gives this non-tail phenotype. Uh huh. Um, th that's a, that's actually a very interesting biophysical question. Like when we think about the transcription, then on um, the the RNA polymerase will go through the first alu SX one element, and then um there's a competing event between that the first intron oh, the first intron is being spliced, which will remove the alu SX one element, or if the transcription is like um fast enough, will go through to the next intron. Then the two uh, alu elements will have to, the or the sequence from the two alu will be able to form a stem loop structure. So exactly how this um, is happening in the biophysical process, I don't have a model. But uh, but what we can assess is uh, assessing their products, like assessing how much of the uh, gene will be a full length transcript or the exon six being skipped. So that, like from our estimation, is close to fifty percent. Thank you. Very fascinating talk. Um, I you. have actually two questions, but they're highly highly related. The first one is, you mentioned that this is an alternative splicing. So have both transcript been observed sometime somewhere in humans? Um, um, short answer is yes. Um, when I'm saying short answer is when when you use a human embryonic stem cell and induce the expression to be a uh, tissue similar to the embryonic tissue, which is a primitive streak, where the TBXT gene are initially expressed. So we definitely see those two uh, different isoforms. And um, I didn't have access to the uh, really the human embryonic tissue to analyze that one. So um, I think because that in vitro differentiation system is well characterized and it really mimics the human embryonic tissue. So I think that that should have like happening um, in the human really in vivo tissue. Awesome. Um, so related to that is because some of your mice, mice that does not have that exon can like fully, can be fully functional. Mm -hmm. It is fair to assume that this particular axon is under less selective constraints than the others? And if so, did you observe any, you know, is it accumulating more mutations than other axons of this gene? Mm, that, that, that's really a great question. Um, 
I, I didn't do the exact, uh, uh, exact analysis comparing the differential mutation rate and this exon versus other exons. Um, but um, but what, what I did is comparing the sequence conservation across species. Um, this exon is, still, uh, is as conserved as other exons um, and they maintain a very high sequence uh, conservation. So, um, and also this uh, exon is, uh, is really required for transcriptional regulation. There are prior studies um, looking at, like when they are doing truncation experiments and found that um, this exon is occupying a very core uh, transcriptional regulation domain. So um, even though like in human, we are generating this uh, small isoform, um, we still need this uh, full lens or wild type as uh, wild type protein so then to be uh, so uh, so then to maintain the low mode embryonic development and one little experiment that we show is the uh, homodigous mutation of exon 6 deletion is lethal so we do need that yeah fascinating thank you very much I, yes. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for questions but remember you can submit them on the app and, or talk to Bo afterwards thank you very much Bo yeah Our next speaker is Julia Craner. Awesome. Um, thanks so much, Brett and the selection committee for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, I'm really excited to share with you some of the work I've been doing to understand um, agricultural adaptation over the last two centuries of a really problematic weed, and that's um, Amaranthus tuberculatus or common water hemp. Um, this is work I've been doing in collaboration with Sally Otto at the University of British Columbia during my postdoc, but also um, through collaborations with my PhD advisors, John Sinchcombe and Stephen Wright at University of Toronto, and uh, Detlef Weigel, Hernan Bernabano, and Sergio Latore at uh, Max Planck tubing in. So uh, by 2018, our world's population had already reached 8 billion people. And feeding our world's population, I think, is one of the biggest challenges of the 21st century. And towards this goal, we've actually already used over 50% of Earth's habitable land towards food production. And while this is really important for human health, um, it also has really important knock-on effects on biodiversity. Uh, agriculture is one of the foremost drivers of climate change, uh, not only through direct impacts on our natural ecosystems, but as a foremost contributor to pollution and also land use change. And actually the footprint of agricultural land use change has been really, really remarkable over the last four centuries. So in the 1600s, we were actually only using 1 million hectares of land towards crop production in the United States and Canada, but at its maximum in the 1950s, actually using over 500 million hectares. And so this period of expansion, particularly between the 1800s and 1950s was one that really started with the industrial revolution. It took more than 50% of North America's workforce out of agriculture and into other industrial sectors and allowed for innovations like commercialized farming and the gas power tractor. But it really wasn't until the 1960s where we moved from expansion into intensification. And this is really to improve the efficacy of agricultural practices. And that actually started with an evolutionary innovation and that was the breeding of high yield crop varieties. But along with those came highly controlled irrigation, widespread mechanization and increased in some ways over-reliance on chemical inputs like pesticides, herbicides and fertilizers. And so this intensification period actually has a ton of potential for actually intensifying selection on plants, animals existing in these uh, environments throughout the change, these changing landscapes. And indeed, I think one of the most striking and unintended consequences of this intensification has been the rapid and repeated evolution of herbicide resistance. This has occurred uh, at least 500 unique times across hundreds of different species. Um, but also to every different chemical compound, we've been able to innovate in an effort to control weeds that reduce the crop yields, right? 
So uncontrolled weeds in agricultural settings are a huge economic cost. In the United States alone, that's $33 billion. And that's because on average, these weeds are reducing crop yields up to 12%. And because of this, uh, the field of weed science in particular has really risen up to understand the genetic basis, in particular, the monogenic basis of herbicide resistance, not only the gene targeted by herbicides, but the particular amino acids, the non-synonymous changes within those amino acids that actually are causal for conferring resistance. Okay, so when we talk about problematic weeds, especially in the Midwestern United States, one of the most problematic is Amaranthus tuberculatus or common water hemp. And not only because it's cross-resistant to eight different chemical compounds of herbicides, but because it's uh, really uh, detrimental in terms of competition with focal crops like corn and soy, so re reducing yields up to 72% in corn. From an evolutionary perspective, it's quite interesting. It's actually dioecious, uh, which is quite rare in plants, meaning they're separate sexes. It's wind pollinated, but it's also highly fecund. So a single individual can actually produce up to 5 million seeds. So there's a ton of potential for high levels of diversity and potentially adaptability in this species that might contribute to excess in agriculture. It's also native. It's native to the United States. And that means that these populations of amaranthus actually predated the agriculturalization of its landscape, right? And so that sets up a nice snapshot for understanding what transitions have had to occur for this plant to become so successful in agricultural environments. And indeed, I think this is a great system for understanding not only the magnitude, but the tempo of adaptation to our changing environments and particularly agricultural change. So what are the genomic signatures of adaptation to agriculture in modern populations? How might that actually be related or driven by demographic change over the last two centuries along with land use change? And how strong has agricultural mediated selection been across contemporary timescales? And can we actually relate that to some of these known shifts in not only agricultural practices, but land use change over the last 200 years? So the first approach we took to address these questions is actually a contemporary population genomic sequencing design. So we went out and we were able to actually collect 17 pairs of natural and agricultural populations across this range. And this pair design is really nice because it allows us to disentangle the fine scale drivers of allele frequency shifts between natural and agricultural environments from broad scale drivers of allele frequency change like demography and potentially climate adaptation uh, on a broader scale across the species and age range. So what actually do these paired uh, samples look like? Well, here I'm just showing you an example from Southern Illinois. I uh, have a natural population here in the bottom right corner. And there's just a really couple of tiny individuals occurring here along this beach, um, less than three kilometers away from a soy field just a few weeks out from harvest that was completely infested, overrun by amaranthus, many, many meters tall. So lots of potential for differences in environmental and ecological selective pressures across these gradients. So with sequence data from 187 of these individuals across paired uh, collections, we can really get at the genome-wide impact of agriculture. And on average, when we look across the genome, actually what we find between natural and agricultural collections is an FST approaching zero. So near panmixia among natural and agricultural environments, really emphasizing the importance of agricultural practices on shaping uh, genetic diversity in nearby natural populations. We can take a much more fine scale approach and ask, can we actually detect signals of agricultural adaptation across the genome? In particular, the effect I was looking for, making use of this replicated pair design, is do we see consistently across uh, population pairs that SNPs are only ever found in agricultural or natural environments, right? And those are SNPs that should be uh, related to antagonistic selection between natural and agricultural environments. A generalized form of this test is called the Cochrane mantle hansel test. And we perform this for uh, just over 7 million sites across all 16 scaffolds in common water hemp. And this actually gives us quite a nice set of agriculturally associated alleles. And the ones that I'll focus on for the rest of the talk predominantly are the red ones. Those are um, independent LD thin SNPs. And why I say this is a nice set is because these uh, alleles are actually enriched for functions in drought, stress, 
growth and reproduction, so things we might expect to be related to adaptation to agriculture, but in particular, herbicides. And so the strongest uh, association or effective agricultural adaptation across the genome falls within uh, scaffold 11, and that is directly within the gene PPO targeted by PPO inhibiting herbicides. But what type of processes, evolutionary processes, over the last two centuries has actually created these patterns across the genome? Well, we can actually combine this modern uh, sampling approach with historical sequencing of herbarium samples. Um, so this was an amazing data set to curate, um, working with nine herbaria across the United States and Canada. And we actually have samples spanning the same geographic range as these contemporary paired populations, but dating back to 1823. Not only that, we have samples collected from across environment types, so agricultural and disturbed habitats, representing these human managed environments, but also natural habitats. So we can ask not only how quickly allele frequency changes proceeded, but how that might be mediated by differences in selection across environments. And actually, I'm not the first person to think about how changes over these recent timescales might actually relate to agricultural adaptation in water hemp. So quite amazing uh, botanist Johnson Sawyer in the 1950s used some of these exact same herbarium specimens to reconstruct this historical range of two subspecies in water hemp, that's Amaranthus tuberculatus to the northeast. And this uh, subspecies very closely mimics the major Mississippi and Missouri water basin, so it's quite riparian occurring in wet habitats. But he actually hypothesized it was the expansion of the southwest uh, subspecies or variety, var rudis, which means ruderal or weedy, that actually contributed to so much of the agricultural invasion we're actually experiencing from this species today. So uh, in doing so, hypothesizing a role for pre-adaptation of var rudis to agriculture. So we can directly test uh, Jonathan Sawyer's hypothesis here by observing how demography, the distribution of ancestry has actually changed through time over the last 200 years. What I'm showing you now is each dot here representing an individual for which we have an estimate of how much of its genome comes from var rudis ancestry. The three different clines represent the distribution of ancestry across the range for three different time spans. So in the darkest purple, the most historical time span, 1828 to 1920. And what we see is a pretty steep cline in ancestry to the west, individuals with pure var rudis ancestry to the east, individuals with pure var tuberculatus. But as we move to more contemporary timescales, we actually see quite a strong shift in the distribution of ancestry, in particular, an excess of var rudis in the eastern part of the range. So this is consistent with uh, Jonathan's hypothesis about the expansion of var rudis over the last 200 years. But now instead of coloring each individual by what time span they were collected from, we can actually ask how this might relate to the environment in which these individuals are persisting. And historically, we see no difference in the distribution of subspecies ancestry across natural and agricultural environments. But what was really striking to see is that when we integrate these modern contemporary paired samples, we're actually able to pick up on a pretty substantial excess of var rudis ancestry in agricultural and disturbed habitats compared to natural habitats. Right? And so what this uh, implies is that this shift in ancestry over the last 200 years has actually facilitated the preferential sorting of var rudis into agricultural environments. So does this actually relate to those signals of selection that I first looked at, those cochrane mantle hansel tests? Well, we actually look for regions across the genome that have those strongest differences in ancestry across agricultural and natural samples. And we indeed and find that those are the same regions that have the strongest signatures of adaptation to agriculture. So what this really excitingly implies is actually, uh, Jonathan Sawyer was right, there's been a key role of standing genetic variation, potentially pre-adaptation in var rudis that's facilitated adaptation to agriculture on these contemporary time scales. Okay, so these herbarium uh, um, repositories of kind of genetic information through time are so exciting because we can not only reconstruct demographic change through time, but we can actually uh, try and infer selection on eco-evo timescales. So what these herbarium samples give us 
is an observation of an individual's genotype at a particular locus, all loci across the genome, if you do whole genome sequencing, at a given time point, right, when that individual was collected. And so uh, how can we get selection from this? Well, we can go back to maybe one of the first equations that uh, I used, I, I learned in my population genetics class, so this general model of selection that posits the frequency of some allele P at time T, uh, depends on the frequency of that allele P sometime in the past, here generation zero, how many uh, generations have occurred since then, but also some rate change parameter, and that's the strength of selection. But we can reorder this equation to take the even a more generalizable form, and that's the form of a log logistic regression model. And when we do that, it actually allows for a really intuitive understanding of what happens when we regress these genotypes, but these within individual allele frequencies on collection here. And what it provides us is a, an estimate of y at x, which is actually now equivalent to the frequency of that allele at some time point, but also we can extract the slope. And that gives us an estimate of the strength of selection, right, associated with that allele frequency trajectory. Okay, so now instead of showing you this for this toy example, I'll show you what this looks like for those agriculturally associated alleles, right, from that Cochrane mantle Hansel test, those 150 uh, independent alleles uh, potentially driven by antagonistic selection. And I'll show you first what that looks like for individuals collected from natural environments. So here are those trajectories for all 155 loci. And I've just colored them by how much they've increased through time. So the yellow ones have increased the least through time, some have even decreased, and the dark purple ones have increased the most. And together, these agriculturally associated alleles have actually increased in natural environments by 6% over the last 150 years. Over this time frame, that's actually not consistent with any significant estimate of selection and that it falls within our null expectation from a randomization procedure. But when we look at the frequency of these agricultural alleles in agricultural and disturbed habitats through time, they've increased by over 22% since the 1870s. And this is consistent with the strength of selection, uh, about 1% on average over the last 150 years. So quite strong. This approach is actually really exciting though, because we can also test a prior hypotheses about how shifts in uh, environmental land use and intensification might actually be related to the allele frequency trajectories that we're observing. In particular, we can test a model that fits one slope versus multiple slopes to ask, do we see a significant shift in selection over this time course? And indeed we do. And the, the break point of the shift in the selection actually falls directly between this expansion and intensification period, which was really remarkable to find. And so these contemporary agricultural alleles really haven't changed, didn't change whatsoever in this expansion, expansion period. What we actually found was since the 1960s, nearly all of that allele frequency increase that we saw has actually occurred after that change to intensification. And this is consistent with even stronger strengths of selection than we initially estimated. So an S of nearly 3% on average for the last 60 years uh, in agricultural environments. And so we see this striking increase through time, not only in agricultural environments, too, but also natural environments. And my hypothesis is that as these alleles have increased in agriculture, recurrent migration, just like we see um, in our contemporary samples is leading to the increase of these alleles in natural environments as well. But the trajectory of agriculturally associated alleles might also depend on effect size. And I think some of the strongest effect size alleles in terms of adaptation to agriculture are those causal, well-known herbicide resistance alleles. So we can actually ask how strong has selection been on these alleles since the introduction of herbicides since the 1950s? And what I wanna draw your attention to is these contemporary frequencies of herbicide resistance are quite remarkably high, even across natural and agricultural populations. So our most frequent one is at a frequency of about 30%. And this is really in striking contrast to the number of observed individuals in our historical examples that segregate for herbicide resistance. And because of that discrepancy in allele frequency, we see an S of 12% on average over the last 60 years in terms of selection on herbicide resistance alleles across the range. Two minutes. Um, so in terms of the magnitude and tempo of adaptation to agriculture, 
think we've actually seen a really striking and pervasive role of gene flow um, in, in, in the importance of agricultural practices in shaping natural genetic variation. And despite that high level of gene flow, strong signatures of polygenic adaptation via growth, reproduction, especially tolerance to stress and herbicides. This adaptation uh, seems to have been strongly facilitated by demographic change, especially the expansion of our rutus by supplying pre-adaptive genetic variation. And that selection driven by agriculture, especially the intensification of agriculture over the last six centuries um, has been much stronger than typically observed in the well, um, between 3% and 12% on extremely rapid time scales. And I think um, beyond these conclusions about amaranthus, I think this case study really highlights the importance of the interdependence of these evolutionary mechanisms for rapid adaptation. So uh, this range expansion has provided new genetic variation across the range in which selection has acted. That's allowed these populations to persist and so that such that new mutations can arise um, and, and, and be strongly selected um, that might further facilitate the expansion of the species across the range um, and its persistence in such environments. So with that, I wanna thank you and take any questions. Hi, uh, Daniel Anstead, uh, Michigan State University. So I was wondering, this varbrutus is very seems very critical to the story, and so I was wondering if sort of the native environments in which it was originally found, if there's if that environment was kind of closer to what agricultural fields would yeah. look like, or or if even potentially they were in in in, in the fields of, of of indigenous people even before. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. Great question. I mean, when it was described in the 1900s, someone called it varrutus, right, which is uh, coming from the word ruderal, which is weedy. So presumably, um, this species was definitely occurring in disturbed uh, environments, and the, those disturbance regimes might really be shaping the types of uh, selection that's occurring in agricultural environments. They're really commonly uh, changing within and across seasons. So, you know, lots of selection potentially on life history. I think, I think that's probably exactly what's happening. Um, and I wish I could go back and <laughs> try and understand the types of ecological pressures that uh, Rudis was experiencing a hundred years ago. Yeah, great question. Hi, uh, I'm Ben Peter from the MPI for Evolutionary Anthropology. Um, so I was wondering, I really like this sort of story, you know, that it's a wild part of the sort of the you call it the agricultural and the natural habitat. And so I was yeah. wondering, like, what proportion of individuals or for the affected populations, I say, is in the in these two habitats? And uh, it did that change over time. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, I have looked at uh, effective population size in the species, um, and I actually used relate recently to look at a change in effective population size through time. And what was striking to see um, is actually like pretty much on the same time scale of this var rudis expansion. I don't know if I can find it. Uh, but yeah, pretty much on the same time scale of this var rudis expansion. So uh, maybe since the 1980s, we see a massive increase in effective population size. So historically, prior to the last 100 years, uh, relate estimates any to be about 70,000. But um, over the last 100 years, it's undergone like a two fold magnitude increase. Um, so it's much closer. I think it's like 700, uh, 7 million any over recent time scales. And I haven't looked at how any is actually differs between natural and agricultural environments, but I think that's like a really uh, great question and a great next step. Uh, hi, I'm Anna from the University of Edinburgh. Um, that was a really good talk. Um, Thank you. I was wondering if you looked at the differences uh, between the sexes at all. In ah, yeah. Um, I actually did a common garden experiment to look at like agricultural adaptation and species. And <laughs> it was almost disappointing because compared to the effect of sex, um, the you know agricultural adaptation was so small in that sex is definitely very important in the species in terms of shaping um, phenotypic diversity. Um, and we see um, there's actually not too much known about um, 
Uh, we know that there's not an actual sex chromosome. So there's a sex determining region. It's young in, uh, in tuberculatus, but there hasn't been much work on it. And I think there's, there's a ton to do on um, sexual dimorphism in the species. Cool. Yeah, great question. Yeah, thanks for this great talk, uh, Marcus from the University of Cologne. I guess I'm surprised, or maybe you can comment on this, yeah. that the frequency of those uh, of resistance uh, alleles is so high in the in the sort of wild or, or undisturbed yeah. population. Yeah, absolutely. Wouldn't the theory expect some uh, fitness effect uh, in, yeah. in in the undisturbed? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was also shocked. Um, it's a little disconcerting to see how, such high levels of herbicide resistance in natural populations. So I wish I had the slide here, but we actually compare these nice across, you know, paired natural agricultural populations, how different is the frequency of resistance. And it's only significantly different for three out of eight populations. And some natural populations you see resistance up to a frequency of like 25%. So really huge. And, um, I mean, it might be just recurrent really high levels of migration that's kind of swamping the effects of negative selection of those alleles on na in natural environments. We actually, uh, in the paper, in our, in our preprint, uh, use a model of migration selection balance to try and infer the relative costs of these alleles in natural environments versus their benefit in agricultural environments. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> farmers are gonna be pretty upset, you know, if, if these alleles are able to persist in natural environments and, and migrate back in. So. Yeah, great question. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Julia. Our next speaker is Malgrzada Costa. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so my name is Małgorzata. I go by my nickname Gosia, and I'm presenting you my work that I've done uh, during my PhD at CBO University of Porto, and currently I'm a postdoc at uh, Institute Pasteur. Uh, and I will talk about genetic basis of carotenoid coloration in birds. Uh, so I can share with you my excitement for diversity of different phenotypes in birds. They can be very colorful, as you can see in the picture, and that's what I'm going to focus on during my talk. But they have many different very cool traits that we can look at genetic basis. And here we have two examples of flight and song. Uh, and uh, we can look at trait polymorphism in two different scales. And one would be across the species. So you have example here of different blue butterflies. But what is very handy model for looking at genetic basis is look uh, at the trait polymorphism within one species, and that's possible in domesticated animals. And here we have very well known example of uh, dogs. Uh, and uh, domestic canary is perfect model for genetics, and that's why uh, it's because uh, the breeders selected canaries for many different traits and it's sort of recent selection. Well, it started around 400 years ago, but of course it depends on which uh, trait uh, we are talking about. And then there are many different traits that we can look at. Uh, so it, it's the coloration I'm, I'm gonna focus, uh, but they have, can have also different posture, uh, different shape of the body, different feathers. And uh, there was also selection on the song, and that's another project I did during my PhD. Um, and overall, there are over 200 breeds of canaries. That's pretty amazing. And then what is very helpful, it's also there are many resources from the breeders uh, that we, we know if uh, the uh, mutation is dominant or recessive uh, and so on. Um, and uh, now let's focus on uh, coloration and in particular um, on carotenoid coloration. Uh, so carotenoids are the pigments that make birds, as you see here in the example, red, orange, and yellow. Uh, and importantly, the birds cannot produce the pigment themselves. They have to acquire it through the diet. Uh, and then there are 
uh, carotenoids are important for many physiological processes. They are implicated in the immune response, antioxidation. Uh, they can be, when they are uh, in big concentration, they can also become toxic. So it's quite a complex uh, trade-off here. Uh, and what was uh, known about the carotenoid genetics before is like people look mostly at the uh, agricultural traits. And there are a few examples of genes that were implicated, like, for example, in the color of fat, uh, that was BCO2. Um, and, but it was not very clear, like, what is the exactly mechanism, how the gene work. Uh, and uh, for the, uh, well, very early in the beginning of my PhD, uh, my PhD advisor, Miguel Carneiro, published a paper about the gene, uh, well, in parallel, actually, with other group, uh, about the gene that makes the birds uh, yellow, and that's zip to J19. And there's actually a missing puzzle of this story that will be coming out this year also uh, for the red uh, physiology. Uh, and then the SCARP1 uh, was shown in the silkworm. Um, but the question, well, here I will present you two uh, projects. So one is focused on how like birds can acquire uh, the carotenoid coloration. And the second one it will be a story about the sexual uh, dichromatism. Uh, so how do birds acquire coloration, uh, carotenoid coloration? That's a good question. How to look at this question? Uh, we selected... Um, breed that is uh, white recessive. It's showed here in the picture. Uh, and we quantified the carotenoid coloration in different tissues. And indeed, we confirmed that those birds don't have any carotenoids. And we compared uh, the, uh, those with the yellow, uh, yellow birds that have, of course, a lot of carotenoids. Uh, and then what we did is we did the uh, pool whole genome sequencing. Uh, we had actually a couple of breeds from the previous study, so uh, we included those. Uh, and then, of course, we sequenced the, the white recessive canaries. Um, and uh, you can see here the FST plot, the population differentiation. Uh, and, uh, well, it's Manhattan plot, of course. And then you can see the uh, chromosome 15 uh, that is... Uh, it's differentiated, and then on that chromosome, the SCARP1, the scavenger receptor class B member one, um, it's located. Uh, and then we looked like what, what is the mutation is uh, in this gene that is actually causing this phenotype of not being able to have carotenoids. Uh, so we found that there is a splice site mutation um, in exon four. Uh, and then we did the uh, capillary electrophoresis. Uh, so you can see that in the white recessive uh, birds, there's like different isoforms. They are in uh, black here. And in yellow birds, we only find the wild type. And then to quantify uh, like how much of those isoforms were in different tissues, we are looking here at uh, qPCR data. And in wild type, in yellow, you can see that they, they, they have only uh, the wild type, whereas the white recessive birds had predominantly the isoform four and also other, uh, other isoforms, but no uh, wild type. Um, so then the um, uh, isoform missing a large uh, portion of exon four, it's the most abundant in white recessive birds. Uh, and then to confirm this uh, funding, uh, we did the uh, experimental validation. Uh, so we transfected um, avian fibroblast cells with the construct of like having this uh, splice site mutation or not. Uh, and here uh, you can see uh, the results of quantification of carotenoid concentration. Uh, so in the black, it's uh, the control. So without any construct, just the uh, fluorescent protein. Uh, and then uh, the in yellow, we have the wild type isoform. So the isoform that has the yellow birds. Uh, and you can see that those cells have a lot of carotenoids, whereas the white recessive in white 
have like similar concentration of carotenoids to, to the control. So they don't really absorb the carotenoids. The, um, yeah. And so here I was able to show you uh, that SCARP1 scavenger receptor, it's an essential mediator of expression of carotenoid-based coloration in birds. Um, and uh, this, uh, this receptor has been actually showed to be important in the horosterol metabolism. Uh, therefore, uh, there's a link between the visual display, the coloration and lipid metabolism. Uh, and finally, as I mentioned in the beginning, the SCARP1 was shown in like silkworm and drosophila. So it seems to be an agent and conserve mechanism of carotenoid uptake uh, in animals. Okay, so now uh, let's move to the sexual uh, dichromatism in birds. Uh, so this is on the uh, mosaic canaries, um, but I will talk about the model in a second. So uh, dichromatism in, is widespread in birds. We know very well that usually uh, the females and males differ in appearance, and then usually males are more flashy. And it applies for different types of coloration. So here you can see the structural coloration and also the um, carotenoid coloration. And uh, sexual selection, it's the major dri driver of, of sexual dichromatism. Uh, and uh, it's not that easy to study it because usually um, the dichromatism is fixed. So either the species have it or not have it. So it's not easy to compare. Uh, but uh, there was a very unique model created by the uh, canary breeders uh, that they cross the monochromatic uh, common canaries. So both males and females uh, are yellow uh, with the red sea skin. Uh, so you can see the big difference in the redness between like males are very red and females not so much. Um, and then the uh, well, there were hybrids and they were back crossed again with canaries. And then the final product of this process is this beautiful uh, mosaic canary breed that looks exactly like canary, but the only difference is that they, they have this uh, difference in the coloration between male and female. Uh, and actually they can have two color forms, so they can be red or, or yellow. Uh, and we used both uh, in our study. Uh, so again, we did the uh, uh, whole genome sequencing of pools for, of the breeds. Um, and we compared, as I said, mosaic red and yellow versus other non-mosaic breeds. Uh, and uh, here uh, we see again the FST plot in the top and the population differentiation. And we have also FD statistics, the fraction of genome shared through infogression. And we see here very clear outlier peak that BCO2 gene, um, it's located and the, the BCO2 has been already implicated in those agricultural traits, as I mentioned before. So that was very good candidate genes. Uh, but anyways, we took other genes from the region and also did the qPCR. Uh, so for PTS and TEX12, there was no differences in the expression, uh, but for BCO2, there was difference in exp expression. So we sampled the um, skin with regenerating feather follicles in the region of the body uh, that there was the difference uh, in the coloration between uh, male and female. Uh, and you can see that the, male, uh, the females have more expression of BCO2 uh, than uh, males. Uh, and then uh, we didn't find any protein coding uh, mutation. Uh, so we hypothesized that this is slightly cis-regulatory. Uh, so we did sample, well, we did cross, and then we sampled the F1 hybrids, uh, and then quantified the proportions of alleles uh, coming either from siskin origin or canary origin, and you can see that there was a very strong bias towards uh, siskin allele. Uh, but as I will see, uh, show in the second, 
there might be also some trans uh, regulation as there are differences uh, between patches. Uh, and then uh, to uh, confirm the uh, function of BCO2, uh, we look at, uh, we did in situ and we look uh, at the pigment content and you can see in the top uh, part of the graph uh, that in pigmented follicle, uh, we can see this uh, yellow, uh, well, yellow pigment in the cells, uh, whereas in the bottom part in unpigmented follicle, we don't see uh, the pigment. And for BCO2, uh, in the top, uh, we don't see uh, the BCO2 expression in pigmented follicle, and in unpigmented follicle, we see uh, a lot of BCO2 expression. So this means that the more uh, BCO2 expressed, the more it's active, uh, the less carotenoids. So to put it into a little bit broader context, um, we did uh, transcriptomics along the uh, di uh, dimorphism continuum. Uh, so we sampled here the wild birds, the common canaries from the Canary Islands, uh, the sister species, uh, European serine uh, and house finch. Uh, and then you can see here in the pictures how males and females look like. And uh, always the male is more flashy, although in common canaries, the difference, it's not that striking. Um, it's, uh, and we focus also on two patches of the body. So on the breast and uh, belly. Uh, and then uh, we look like how big the difference is. So for example, in European serine, there is a big difference in both patches. Like the, the male has a lot of coloration, the female doesn't. Uh, but both in common canary and house finch, the breast is much more colorful in uh, male, but the female doesn't, uh, doesn't really have the coloration. Uh, and then for the belly, uh, the both males and females didn't have that much coloration. Uh, so here uh, in those uh, circles, you can see the numbers of differentially expressed genes for between those patches. Uh, and we can observe that the bigger difference was then the more differentially expressed genes uh, there were. So gene expression divergence between males and females um, correlates uh, with sexual uh, diffomatism. And then uh, we did intersect it all those comparisons uh, that we did. So we look at differences between patches, so the breast and belly, uh, differences uh, between sexes, so males and females, and between uh, differences uh, between species, so the common canaries and uh, sister species, uh, European serine. Um, and uh, there were in total 12 uh, genes in common between all those different comparisons, and one of them was BCO2. So we also look uh, at the patterns uh, of BCO2 differentiation. So in this big graph uh, of BCO2, you can see how much coloration, carotenoid coloration there is uh, below the graphs in the uh, circles. So the, the dark means a lot of carotenoid pigmentation. Uh, and then, yeah, different patches, so chest and belly. Uh, and we can see basically all those uh, significant differences between patches, sexes, and species. But what you quickly notice, uh, and then uh, the uh, males are green and the females are blue. Uh, but what you quickly notice is also that there is no difference in house finch. So most likely there is other mechanism that um, it's responsible for the striking sexual uh, diffomatism in house finch. So therefore BCO2, it's a general mechanism for acquiring sexual diffomatism, but it's not the only one. Uh, and then, um, well, I was able to show you that uh, diffomatism in birds can be generated by simple molecular mechanism driven by large effect genes uh, that exert the functions on the peripheral tissues. Uh, and then there, there, there is a d debate like if the, uh, well, if the carotenoid signaling is shaped more by resource limitations, but it seems that it's actually shaped more by, by cellular processes. Um, and then 
the question, there are usually more questions after the study than before the study. So I'm still curious, like how many genes mediate carotenoid coloration. And it's very striking to me to see BCO2 all over popping up again. Um, and then the, the big question I think in evolutionary biology is if the carotenoid coloration is honest signaling. So that's what was believed for a while. Um, but then it seems that instead of like, you know, being very uh, expensive trait, like to, to be able to acquire this carotenoids to be beautiful male, it's actually a little bit other way around that females also have carotenoids, but they have, they just re, uh, remove them. Uh, so I think this is an open field for like asking many more follow-up questions and doing experiments and trying to figure out the role of carotenoids in signaling. And here I would like to uh, thank all my uh, mentors, collaborators, uh, funding, and uh, well, all of you here. And it's a great pleasure to be, an honor to be in this uh, session to be able to present my work. And I'm happy to take any questions. We have plenty of time for questions. Hi, I'm David Rand from Brown University. Uh, there's some uh, hypotheses that carotenoids are involved in sexual selection for mitonuclear matching, which is my personal worldview. But is there any evidence of this in your analysis of genetics? Like if you did the crosses in the other direction, does the carotenoid follow any maternal line, therefore mitochondrial? genetics. Can you get a little bit closer to the microphone? Because it's very hard to understand in the max story. Yeah, sorry. The question is, uh, there's some suggestions that the coloration and sexual selection is driven by mitochondrial nuclear co-adaptation mismatch. Or, um, is there any evidence that there's pathways in this that are important and that might be encoded by mitochondrial genes? Uh, yes, uh, th there are some studies about the importance of uh, mitochondrial uh, metabolism for coloration, but I, I haven't really, like, I, I'm not sure how I could relate my studies to this. Yeah. <laughs> I am uh, Sam Widmeyer from Northwestern University. Uh, awesome talk. Um, you hinted a little bit at the role of potentially diet for mediating this response, right? There's this yeah. really nice regulatory mechanism once you have this, in, in this cross in particular. Can you speculate a little bit on how you would go about functioning or uh, functionally validating this interaction between this regulatory mechanism and testing your hypothesis that you mentioned, right? If there's this debate about the role of acquiring these carotenoids in the diet. Yeah, that is a very good question. <laughs> um, well, so th this will not be exactly the answer, but like we, we are trying actually to, to find out the, the exact mutation and it's very tissue specific. Uh, so it seems to be acting only in the skin. And then if you look in the internal organs, they, they have like similar, like we looked at the control in the liver and they have similar, uh, concentrations of carotenoids, uh, but yeah, how to functionally test the role in the signaling, uh, this is what I'm thinking about, and I would be very happy if other people think about the two and do some experiments, because I'm really curious to see, like, what, what will be the outcomes. Hi, a uh, very cool talk on um, Boxia from NYU. Um, so you, you you see some of those genes, like uh, including BCO2, they're like uh, sexually uh, dimorphized, expressed. So do you see any kinds of uh, the regulatory elements, regulatory region of those genes have the uh, sexual hormone related um, gene expression regulation? Sorry, expression uh, regulatory elements. Uh, sorry, can you repeat? 
on um, like um, for example, there are some um, like estrogen receptor like they, they could act as like transcription factors. Uh, are there any this kind of regulator elements in the um, for example promoter or enhancer region mm -hmm. at the uh, BCO two? So, so we are not yet really sure about the specific regulatory elements. So what we tried to do was like we did the attack sequencing in, in the skin and tried to find out the differences between the mosaic and non-mosaic. What is very challenging here is that the skin tissue is very difficult to work with and the attack sequencing doesn't really work very well. Uh, but we are still trying to do it and hopefully uh, we are getting an answer soon. <laughs> Thank you. But it's work in progress. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Magrizana. Well, I hope you enjoyed those five talks as much as I did exciting thought-provoking science all from people at the beginning of their careers so uh please join me in thanking all five of our speakers